the Sustainability Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. The Stevens Institute of Technology is proud to present the Hugo New Corporation Sustainability Seminar Series, co-sponsored by Geocentric Consultants, H2M Architect Engineers, Brown and Codwell, and BEM Systems. Thanks, Dibs, and um, I want to say uh, thank you to Isabel for, for joining me today. I, I feel um, it's very special um, given her expertise in the uh, topical area. Um, and for those of you who, uh, you know, I always like to, to uh, typically uh, get to know my audience. So uh, this one is, is uh, interestingly challenging because I do know there are some colleagues out there uh, who have indicated their interest in, in participating. Um, so for, for those of you who are here uh, to get credit and um, extra points, um, I hope we can help you out today. Uh, those students. Um, for those of you who um, are here because you wanted to get out of babysitting, um, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are here because you just want to learn something new and you have your special beverage in your hand, welcome. Um, this is a, a topic that uh, actually you heard Dibs indicate um, I've had uh, a career with USCPA and um, and I do want to thank colleagues out there that brought this whole arena to my attention. The more I learn about uh, biochar and um, the ability to take uh, different waste streams and make them of value um, as we focus on the need to uh, develop circular economies and multi-beneficial solutions, I just get more excited. Um, it, I do have to start and acknowledge that uh, we certainly are in um, a whole different time. In fact, that we don't know quite what we're experiencing to this extent. But um, I do want to say thanks to all of the medical professionals um, and others on the front lines, uh, certainly uh, public and, and private sectors who are, who are stepping up. Uh, to try to see us safely through this, uh, this difficult time. And um, as I thought about it, um, you know, why is this topic uh, that we're calling biochar for healthy soil and water um, even more important uh, given today's circumstances? Uh, this, this coronavirus, uh, which has been named a worldwide pandemic, a global health and economic crisis, um, interestingly enough, you know, we, we've heard about H1N1 when this, this whole um, uh, infectious spread uh, started to happen in China and beyond. Um, for those of you who remember or um, have been focused on, on the chronology of these types of pandemics, um, H, H1N1 was a swine flu. It was another version of the first significant pandemic, worldwide pandemic, which was called the Spanish flu. Um, it was a flu, so it was essentially um, spread, you know, by uh, uh, respiratory or aerosols, as we say in the, 
kind of microbiology world. Um, it, the mortality rate was quite significant. Um, over a billion people infected, um, hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, it actually uh, was more severe for those who were 60, and uh, um, I'm sorry, for, for those who were 60, 65 and older, actually they, they survived it. It was the younger people who were more vulnerable to that particular um, contagious uh, episode. Uh, this COVID, now what was interesting about these, these viruses is they're very small and they mutate. And what we're seeing, uh, as we saw with H1N1, swine flu, um, the, or the original H1N1, um, the, the, uh, the first swine flu, which was called the Spanish flu, was thought to have avian um, or, or origins, bird. Um, second one, 2009, swine flu, jumped from animal, from bird to mammal to people. Um, as I sort of started to take an interesting look at these novel coronaviruses. Uh, not sure how many of you have, uh, have been focusing on these kinds of attacks in the animal world, but there was a similar uh, coronavirus that attacked uh, um, pigs, the hog industry, in 2014. And um, in fact, uh, if you, you focus on that Second paragraph, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci at that time made this statement, to thwart a severe outbreak, you can at least keep an eye on what's happening in the animal kingdom. Uh, it, in 2009, H1N1 was percolating in the swine population for a while. We weren't monitoring the swine population particularly well, and so we missed it. Um, this was in response to a study done um, in Ohio that uh, severely impacted the, the swine industry resulting from this particular uh, porcelain coronavirus outbreak. Uh, th that history is, is peculiar to that of H1N1. Um, origins, birds, um, moved from bird, uh, birds to to mammals um, and from mammals uh, to people. And if you think about uh, the, the modes of transmission and the fact that our, our, how we handle our waste becomes increasingly important for this particular um, virus, um, it, it is manifested it not only from a respiratory standpoint, but fecal. Um, in fact, you know, some may, of you may be aware that the Sierra Club is now um, uh, suing about uh, land application biosolids coming out of waste facilities with the concern for this and other emerging pathogens and contaminants in terms of what you ultimately do with waste. And I, in fact, put this uh, statement, University of Arizona Water and Energy Sustainable Technology Center um, is offering sewage surveillance for a coronavirus. So they hop around, they mutate. And what we don't know is why does something that's been around, in fact, for, for so many years, suddenly express itself um, in a pandemic? This has happened um, it, for every one of these. There are hundreds of millions of these uh, viruses that exist, but why do they suddenly uh, attack um, our human health as, as we are experiencing now. Are there other prevailing um, activities? Have we contributed to that just as we have to now um, antibiotic resistant pathogens? But no one really knows, but we have to suspect that in this ecosystem, um, when something is off, as Dr. Fauci said, in this case, pay attention to animals in 2014, because next it could be people um, and vice versa. And it all um, impacts our economy. And I, I just want to focus on waste, um, the interconnectedness here, and this topic today um, as a, a viable you know, a solution for reducing 
um, these types of uh, threats and, and impacts, um, a, a, along with the fact that we're, uh, we're growing as a, as, a, as a world population um, is of concern, and with population growth is waste, uh, the growth of waste, growth of solid waste. Um, now think about all the medical waste uh, that's coming out of our medical institutions dealing with um, uh, this illness now. And where is it going to go? How is it going to be handled? Typically, that's been um, incinerators. That's greenhouse gas heavy. But, but we, we certainly don't want the threat. Uh, but landfills, um, in fact, and land application and biosolids, uh, we're finding, um, actually have uh, unregulated pollutants like uh, perfluoral uh, forever chemicals that we're hearing of that uh, cause a variety of, of human um, illnesses. And in, in fact, um, they're called forever because that floral, carbon floral bond is, is, is impossible uh, to, to actually um, destroy. It has to be under high heat, a thousand degrees Celsius, something there. Our treatment systems were never designed uh, to address per these perfluoral chemicals. They were designed uh, to disinfect. Um, and that, that we can be assured of is that our drinking water systems and our wastewater systems. However, think of combined sewer overflows where you, we have these increasing rain events, climate for sure, um, increasing rain events, more flooding, that is untreated water. So now we have an added um, impact uh, to be concerned about. We've got a number of chemicals. So the picture you see down on the right, uh, these actually, this was a dairy farm that had to shut down because biosolids have historically been um, applied uh, to many farm fields. Uh, the cow's milk um, was coming up positive for high levels of PFAS. Um, we're all one, we're all interconnected. And again, waste management becomes an increasing area of concern. Um, stormwater, um, it, which has been a, a predominant focus of mine for, for many years, um, still is um, increasing concern for what I've listed here as you know, true challenges and why we need innovations in technology and why we need our, our, our students like you um, thinking from a standpoint of the balance and the importance of sustainability and the different types of expertise that we need to start rethinking um, um, how we avoid uh, waste um, in, our, in our landscapes, pathogens, algae, harmful algal blooms, perfluorinated compounds, nutrients runoff, pesticides. Um, think of every time there's a flood, our site at Corny Point, which by the way, the reason I'm very, uh, still very invested in these kinds of solutions is we call ourselves ground zero for net zero. We're all about promoting alternative approaches and circular economies that get us more sustainable solutions. So manure um, has been land applied, and we're going to talk today about how there are alternatives to taking what was once considered very beneficial. Later, as we've grown and as these operations have grown, we've seen runoff of nutrients um, in eutrophication. As you can see, the alg algae bloom moves down at the bottom right uh, that have come off the landscape. Um, and now destroying our, our water resources. Um, we, we have alternatives. Uh, same for, for biosolids. And I'm sure everyone's aware of the, the other pervasive, gro fast growing problems associated with plastics and endocrine disruptors. And of course, all of this costs. So why then are we talking about the importance of healthy soil and water as it relates to a sustainable solution. Let's start with what, what, what we're talking about. What is healthy soil? What do we mean when we say healthy water? Um, you can see just the, the balance of a good loam. 50% solids, 25% air, 25% solid water. Nutrient rich, uh, should have a, a, a balanced consistency. 
although we know some of our soils um, um, actually are dirt. Uh, we rendered them um, infertile. Uh, certainly in, in um, the agricultural world, there's now sort of a, um, a, a revisiting um, of healthy soil in terms of regenerative agriculture and how to move away from over application of chemicals and actually look at the microbiological needs to bring back healthy soil, um, alternative uh, cover crops and things like that. Healthy water, fishable, swimmable, drinkable. Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Acts, of course, have uh, been the, um, the, the, the pivotal drivers of protection of our the waters in, in our country, it's all connected. Um, we know that we may, may see contaminants in, ground, in surface water that gets to groundwater and vice versa where it percolates. Um, important that we protect our watersheds uh, that actually serve as recharge zones um, that actually functionally protect these water bodies while enabling healthy economies through uh, recreation and the need that we have, and in fact, um, biomimicry and biophilic dis uh, discussions where we're saying people have to have a connection to nature. And I hope everyone during this pandemic um, can get out in some areas uh, uh, where you can uh, be safe uh, with, in terms of social distancing, but connect yourself to nature. Oops. In a word about climate change impacts, I mentioned it earlier with um, increase, increasing storm frequency, population growth, greenhouse gases uh, last year measured to hit an all time high. Uh, in 2018, carbon dioxide emissions rose to 3.4% in the US. You can see uh, this graphic on the left um, in terms of the impacts of uh, unmitigated growth of, of carbon emissions. 37 billion tons of CO2 um, uh, throughout the world in those uh, contributions. Uh, with more uh, development has come uh, more emissions. And we, we now know, the, in fact, we're hearing we have 10 years. We've got to actually start to decarbonize and reduce that footprint. Total carbon emissions from all human activities, energy, ag, uh, land expected to cap off at over 43 billion tons. I don't know if the final numbers have been in for, uh, for 2019. So, so here's where, where healthy soils come in. Uh, soils really do play an important uh, role in combating climate change. And of course, as we know, in our food um, and in fact, um, water protection uh, it, it is all related. You can see on the right, I'm not sure if you can see that on your screen, uh, the, the functions of what we would consider to be um, healthy soil um, are extensive. Healthy soil, in fact, means healthy waters. We've lost a lot of soils. Um, we've also, as I mentioned earlier, rendered those soils um, inert um, as well as contaminated. However, in terms of being a major carbon sink, soils contain 2,500 gigatons of carbon. Um, that's more than three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and four times the amount stored in all living plants and animals. Um, and I just noted what a gigaton is. This particular um, um, Avenue, I, I would say for the future, the importance of why we're advocating for healthy soil here, here to return its functionality, its functionality and its capability of reducing the impacts of greenhouse gases um, is this transferral uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the soil through crop residues and all other organic solids. Soil or organic matter, very important um, for healthy soil, for soil uh, quality improvement, and also for um, improved water quality. 
It improves the soil structure, it reduces erosion, leads to improved water quality in groundwater and surface water, and as indicated earlier, very important for our food, food security um, and the health of our ecosystems. And so now to, to biochar. What does biochar have to do with all of this? I love this quote from Dr. Dorothy Hamill, a NASA uh, scientist um, who's also uh, crazy about bi biochar as I am and um, had this quote, biochar is the environmental superstar. Um, not sure why that just popped up. Maybe Samir's telling me something. Um, it is, uh, it is viewed, uh, it, it removes heavy metals from soils, it enriches fa farmland, filters groundwater, sequesters carbon, um, and why uh, we have yet to discover, in fact, all of its, its true value. Uh, quoting Dr. Lehman from Cornell University, a global expert um, uh, in biochar and carbon sequestration, uh, estimates that producing biochar from biomass could sequester carbon equivalents to 12%. And carbon, biochar sequesters carbon, it's, it's um, carbon negative, Think of Amazonian uh, clay, the, the richness, uh, thousands of years, it converts it into a stable element in that soil that can stay in the ground for millennia. And what is uh, biochar? Just a summary, and we'll hear from uh, Dr. Lima um, more about biochar, uh, what it is, its characteristics, and her extensive research and um, its ability to bioremediate um, in addition to other uh, beneficial applications. Um, it's carbon rich and it's produced by uh, heating biomass. It, it, there are a variety of techniques uh, through which to produce it, uh, uh, thermochemical uh, techniques. It's residual of bioenergy um, uh, production. So uh, in producing biochar from these uh, waste streams, we, you can produce energy. It's a porous solid with a number of beneficial properties, which we'll hear about. And it, of course, is dictated by its feedstock, along with the, um, the, the conditions, whether that's pyrolysis or gasification, et cetera, uh, to produce it. And I want to bring, bring it sort of back here before turning it over to Dr. Uh, Lima. Uh, we, in looking at biochar, um, from waste to beneficial use, uh, we have the ability to create um, uh, resourceful materials that can solve uh, not only the needs that we have for uh, bringing back the health of our natural resources, but also uh, the ability to address other, other types of problems. And, and what I'm hearing now more recently is um, the ability to convert biochar, which is a carbon uh, material, into graphite, which is for, for new emerging uh, technologies and uh, AI could be pretty incredible when you, you think about that global economy and the needs there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Lima. All right. Thank you so much, Dominic. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, give my spiel on biochar. So as uh, Dominic has mentioned, um, biochar is this, this wonderful um, material that's been around for a few decades now. Um, the International Biochar Initiative um, non-profitable organization has this definition that you can see here as a solid material obtained from the thermochemical conversion and I'll explain what that is in a minute of biomass in an oxygen limited environment it can be used as a product itself or mixed in as a blended product with a whole bunch of other things um, the range of applications is really unlimited um, and it can be used for soil improvement, to improve resources um, and their, utiliz their better utilization. Mainly can be used as a remediation agent 
and or protection against particular environmental pollution and as an avenue for greenhouse gas mitigation. So that's a full mouth of, of applications and uses for um, this one wonder product. Next one, please. Um, this is a busy um, slide, but it basically kind of gives you an idea what I was talking about. So when it comes to biochar, you do have a myriad of different feedstocks that you can use. Um, biochar basically is the biological version of a charcoal, right? So it has to have a feedstock of biological nature, but that biological nature can be a biomass material, it can be forest material, it can be an agricultural waste, either from uh, plant-based or animal-based. It can be a refinery uh, co-product. Um, it can be anything as long as there's certain um, given characteristics of their biological material. And one of them is a certain amount of carbon, which is pretty given in um, all these materials here on the left. So basically you have a whole bunch of feedstocks and then you have the process of, um, can you go back? Thank you. You have a process and, and the thermochemical, um, the thermochemical um, platform means that you're warming uh, that material under high temperature and very low oxygen to none. So um, it can be slow and fast pyrolysis. It can be um, gasification, carbonization, and um, depending on those and depending on the feedstock, then you have different products. So really that's why um, in the literature out there, a lot of people mentioned this terminology as designer biochar, because the more we understood, understand about the biochar, the more we know that depending on the feedstocks we use, the ways of converting that feedstock, whether it is through slow or fast pyrolysis, gasification, whatnot, we get different products that then have different uses and applications as you see there on the right side. So um, mainly, um, I would say biochar doesn't even compete with um, what we originally were comparing it with, which is the activated carbons. So um, it has such um, great number of applications that really it does not compete. Next one, please. Okay, um, so basically, uh, um, as compared to the biological conversion, we have thermochemical conversion, means high heat. Um, and the, the thermochemical conversion, the most um, known one is pyrolysis. And then if you break down that word, pyro is lysis. Um, pyro is heat, lysis is breaking apart those bonds to produce um, basically a new compound, which is the biochar. Um, and then you produce, depending on whether you have a gasification situation or a pyrolysis situation, you produce um, different ratios of three main compounds. You produce a syngas, you produce a biochar, and you can produce a bio oil. Those three um, compounds can be further used into different things and their relative proportions are different depending on whether you're gasifying, you're pyrolyzing, et cetera. On the right side of that slide, you see um, um, Cooltech gasifiers. These gasifiers have been particularly designed to handle animal manures, and they um, are excellent um, devices to produce uh, very high quality uh, manure biochars. Next one, please. So again, as I mentioned, biochar and activated carbon, different things. Um, activated carbon really is made from mainly fossil fuels. A little bit of it is made from coconut shell and wood, but mainly from fossil fuels, uh, particularly with coal. Um, activated carbon is always have been known as an excellent adsorbent. Um, it was um, highlighted in, in war times with, with uh, little cartridges for, um, for cleaning air that people use during war times. But non-war times, it was highlighted mainly during the, the enactment of the Clean Water Act and the, uh, the Clean Air Act. 
So um, they, they're both excellent adsorbents and they have high degrees of porosity in large amounts of surface area as I mentioned here. Next one, please. But they're different things. And I would say the main difference is that biochar is a biological material and activated carbon is usually made from coal, so it comes from a fossil fuel. Um, they share adsorption properties with activated carbon. Um, biochar is different in a very particular way. Biochar has a significant amount of ion exchange capacity and activated carbon is not known to have that. Activated carbon is known to have very high um, porosity. So uh, it relies on what's called um, physical adsorption. So it has very high porosity. So compounds are adsorbed to its pore sites, basically based on a physical fit, but not necessarily a chemical fit. And that's not the case for biochar. Biochar is based on a chemical fit. There's an, a chemical attraction between the pores of the biochar and whatever molecule might be adsorbed onto the biochar. That's a particularly important uh, difference there. Biochar is also low density as compared to the higher density of the activated, activated carbons. And activated carbons are really only used for the remediation market, but mainly for organic compounds. Again, compounds that are traditionally um, non-polar and um, don't have much surface chemistry to them. Biochar, on the other hand, is used as soil amending, which um, activated carbon is not. Um, they both, of course, provide, based on their surface area, great voidage aeration, significant cation exchange capacity for the biochar, and the ability for the biochar only to increase the nutrient uptake and the soil fertility. And I'll go into that in the next few slides. Next, please. Okay, not only um, biochar has different characteristics, it also needs um, much less energy to be produced than the activated carbon and is also much less expensive. And one of the reasons why is that because it's, um, its feedstock is basically free because it uses, uses waste material, biological materials that have no value to them, where usually activated carbon is made from um, coal and coal um, is expensive. As far as um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, activated carbon also emits way more than biochar and the price of activated carbon is much higher than that of the biochar. And again, like, like uh, the reasoning I mentioned, um, if we start designing um, activated carbons that are specifically um, created for some niche markets, then uh, the price of uh, activated carbon can go significantly up from that. So biochar is a great soil amendment and it's viewed as carbon negative because remember, we've taken CO2 from the air to grow a lot of these crops that we then use to make biochar. And the other thing is when you use it in the soil, it remains in the soil for millennia. Um, and that's why it's such a desirable product to use, especially under current circumstances where we're trying to uh, navigate the increasing amount of CO2 in the air. Next one, please. All right, so when I started working on biochar way back then, my premise was not even um, the manufacturer of biochar itself. My premise was I was trying to address um, a problem, an agricultural problem, a pollution problem. I, was a, I, I had the agriculture community as a whole coming to me and saying, we have huge problems, just like Dominic had mentioned with animal manure. Um, we produce it in this, uh, confined animal feeding operations in large, large amounts. We really um, don't know what to do with it. It's way in large quantities. We don't know what to do with it. And we need solutions that are value added because currently um, using it as a soil amendment was just not cutting it. And it was just becoming a disposal issue. Um, and, um, and because it was in concentrated amounts, we, we just didn't have enough land to spread it all out. So um, you might be surprised, but um, in those com confined animal feeding operations, poultry, swine, and cattle, they do produce over five times the waste of, of, of us humans. And that's about 175 million tons of manure each year. Um, besides that, there's um, um, about 129 and 176 million 
dry metric tons available from either forestry or in general agricultural wastes that are available for us to use for bioenergy and bio products. So let's just go ahead and make use of that. Um, in addition to that, we know that there's impacts of our agriculture and um, this was a, a report that was put out that out of the 3.6 million miles of rivers and streams in the US, farming impairs water quality to some degree in about 18% of the 0.7 million miles that states were assessed. So, and as Dominic had mentioned, we have an increase in public and regulatory concern from the impact of animal waste on the quality of life and the environment. Next one, please. All right, so, so what are the agricultural residuals? There are myriad of them. Um, when it comes to animal manures, um, interesting enough, as you can see there on the left side, um, of all our consumption, I would say that poultry was the one that sadly increased over time. Everything else kind of remained. Um, this is the amount of meat produced in the US um, um, based on the type of meat. And then um, as, as far as um, the black line is the total amount of meat produced. So that means that every time we produce this much meat, guess what we also produce? We produce manure. So we have that left to handle. Um, on the lower left corner, this is an emptied poultry house after the birds have gone out. And that's just the residue. So basically that's all the litter left. Um, um, poultry facilities dress their barns every time uh, the poultry come out. They dress it with a litter or wood shavings and then um, a new flock of birds comes in and the manure gets deposited in their wood shavings. So in my discussions further, every time I refer to poultry litter or broiler or turkey litter, that's the mixture of the wood shavings with the manure. If I refer just to the manure, that's just the manure itself. So um, why use animal manure? Um, well, as you see, it's plentiful, cheap and renewable. As long as we can continue consuming meat, um, it's going to be there in large amounts. They do contain intrinsic properties and land is not an issue. This is major. I don't have to grow anything in order to produce this feedstock to make biochar. I don't have to grow trees. I don't have to grow plants. Um, it's already there available and land is not an issue and I have to handle it. I have to put it somewhere. It is a liability to animal farmers, to the growers and to the refiners. Um, and the thing is, um, because it's concentrating in large amounts, it actually, that becomes a problem to the farmers because they cannot dispose of it. But if you make use of it, well, you have a manufacturing facility with biochar right next to a large facility where they uh, produce manure in large quantities. So there you go. It's produced in large quantities. Nobody wants to be trucking manure from place A to place B. So our proposal is to add value by transforming this residuals into biochars via thermochemical conversion. And, and that way we help protect the environment and our public health. Next. Okay, so a little bit of properties about um, the biochar. Um, I've done extensive amount of research over the last couple of decades on several feedstocks for, um, for biochar. Um, I mainly looked at two types of um, poultry, broiler, which are um, birds for meat and turkey. I've looked at swine manure, dairy manure, and then um, in red, I've looked at making the same biochars, but instead of using the manures, I've used three very common reference materials to make biochar. I use coal, coconut shell, and wood. So basically I'm comparing animal-based biochars with um, plant-based biochars. So I'm looking at different um, straightforward properties of the biochars just to compare them side by side. Initial and final yield, this means that if I start with 100 kilos of uh, broiler manure, I end up receiving 40 kilos of um, broiler manure biochar. And the final yield means that because the manure, um, they usually have high ash content. If I decide to do a mild ash uh, wash and rinse some of that additional ash, what happens? So I, that's why I have initial and final yield. 
Ash content is pretty high, as you can see, in the manure-based biochars and is not in the plant-based biochars. That's pretty straightforward um, common. Bulk density ranged between 0.38 and about um, 0.60 grams per cubic centimeter. As I mentioned before, it's a very light material, very high porous. Surface area of the biochars is actually pretty good. It ranged between 92 and 300 um, on the manure biochars and on the plant-based biochars, it was a little lower. Um, interesting enough, in this surface area too, it's important to understand that um, there's no such thing as just surface area. Surface area is, is um, an indication of micropores, macropores, and mesopores. That's the size of the pore. And then depending on the distribution of those pores within the porosity, you might have different ability for that biochar to um, absorb certain materials. So the micropore percentage there right next to the surface area is an indication that not only these biochars have a high surface area, but a large large portion of that surface area is in the micropore region, which is a good thing. Um, adsorption, um, this is just um, a little idea of how much they absorb of copper specifically, but I'll go into that in the next few slides. Um, because of the mineral content of some of these um, manure-based materials, pH values of the biochar is relatively high. It's on the alkaline version when it comes again, another thing that makes them different than the plant-based biochars is that the plant-based biochars have usually lower pH range values. And finally, if you decide to um, do a steam activation, which is basically bombarding at the high temperature those biochars with steam, you increase the porosity significantly. That's all you do, nothing else changes, but you do increase the porosity significantly, and that's what happened here when uh, the biochars were steam activated, um, st surface area increased significantly, particularly on the um, plant-based ones, because they have a, a stronger carbon backbone. So they, um, they were able to activate further and, and have in increased porosity. Next one, please. All right, um, heavy metal absorption. This is one thing that blew my mind when I first started working with the biochars. And um, really quickly here, we're looking at um, adsorption of these four major heavy metals in individual mode versus competition mode. So the whole bar on the right um, is how much of that metal would be absorbed individually. And the blue bar is how much it would be absorbed if that metal would be in combination with the other three. So um, again, the first three bars on the left for each metal are the manure-based biochars, and the four bars next to it are the um, plant-based biochars. So as you can tell, the manure-based biochars absorb significant amounts of all these metals with the exception of nickel, and the same was not true for the plant-based um, biochars. Uh, because again, there's, the functionality is just not there, and I'll go into detail a little bit later. On the left side here, you look at single and competition as well. And you look at, um, in terms of um, single and, and, and competition, the same thing with broiler manure, broiler litter, the coal, coconut shell, and wood. And you see again that the numbers, um, as far as heavy metal absorption, were significantly higher for the manure-based biochars. Next one, please. Um, on the right side, you see, this is what distinguishes um, on a very um, uh, micro um, level, a biochar and an activated biochar. So basically, this is a piece of manure biochar on the, on the top and on the bottom, that piece of biochar was activated, steam activated, and that increased significantly the amount of porosity. Um, when we look at comparing the biochar with the activated counterpart. We see that the biochar does pretty well, but when you steam activate it, because you do increase um, the surface area, not only you have a higher surface area, but you also have more access to that functionality that, that is there to begin with in the biochar. So the broiler litter, the broiler manure, the turkey litter and the turkey manure, 
biochar and the carbon, which is the activated counterpart, they all did pretty well at absorbing, um, in terms of milligrams per grams, absorbing these heavy metals. And um, specifically so when you compare them to the coal, coconut shell, and wood counterparts. On the left side, you see what the EPA discharge limits are for these metals. So you see um, how much you would have to add to um, treat um, a body of water that would have those types of metals and how much you would have to add biochar. Not much at all based on those um, amounts that you see here. Next one. All right, so for me, it was interesting. The more I got puzzled about all this manure biochar, the more I decided, but what is it exactly in manure biochar that is making them do such a good job at absorbing heavy metals, particularly because um, if you compare them with um, activator carbons, activator carbons are not really known for um, heavy metal absorption. So what is in them? So what I did is that I did a study and I compared side by side uh, manure biochars with wood chip biochar. So basically I, would, I used the forestry by product and I used the manure by um, feedstock. I made biochars, I activated the biochars two different ways via steam and via acid, and then I compare them side by side. These are isotherms, so I expose the biochars and the activator biochars to increasing amounts of um, copper solutions, um, and then I looked at um, absorption capacity. So absorption capacity is Q of zero here on the bottom um, left or the bottom right, shows that <clears throat> when you compare um, the absorption capacity of basically wood and chicken litter, um, either activated with steam or acid, you see that, yes, we increase significantly the amount of copper that was absorbed when you acid activated um, the wood biochar, but we already had pretty good results with chicken litter that didn't even have to be acid activated, just on the biochar alone or just by steam activation. Acid activation is always a very expensive ordeal to do, um, involves the use of acid. So um, if you can get away with not having to acid activate, then you can produce a biochar that is much more competitive in terms of price point. Um, not only um, the, the acid activation and the steam activation increase the surface area, but more so the fact that we had chicken uh, biochar versus wood that turned to be the deal breaker when it comes to um, the ability to absorb copper iron, uh, copper ions. Um, and then I started looking into one very particular thing. And in this case, it was the amount of phosphorus in the feedstock. So because I had looked previously into a myriad of uh, manure-based uh, uh, feedstocks to use biochar, I realized that there was a very high relationship between the amount of phosphorus in that manure and the uh, ability of that manure biochar to remediate heavy metals. And here you can confirm that. Not only wood is poor in phosphorus, um, you see the chicken litter um, is much higher in phosphorus. And there's pretty a good relationship between the amount of phosphorus, which in this case translates into a surface functionality um, and the ability of that biochar to absorb um, copper ions. In this case, um, the surface charge um, that is right there on the, on the first column doesn't even translate as measured traditionally for an activated carbon, doesn't translate into uh, absorption capacity for copper because surface charge measures certain specific surf, uh, functional groups, but doesn't necessarily take into account the phosphate groups that you can find in manure-based carbon. So, we couldn't find a relationship between that surface charge and um, the ability of that biochar to pick up copper ions. That's, that was an interesting outcome. Next one, please. All right, so again, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I started sus suspecting that phosphorus, not necessarily the only culprit, but pretty much the one that I thought was um, pretty high related to the ability of this manure-based um, biochars and activated carbons to do a good job at absorbing heavy metals. So you see there that when you have broiler litter, you have 
about 1.66, and this is in um, grams per 100 grams of biochar. Um, that goes up to 3.68 in the biochar, and then when you activate that biochar, it goes up. And these amounts were much higher in the poultry-based carbons than they were in the um, um, plant-based carbons. And in within the animal manure carbons, um, they were much higher in the poultry than the swine and the dairy. And all that translated into um, higher ability to um, adsorb heavy metals. Um, on the bottom right side, we compared actually doing some interesting treatments on some pecan shells, and we did increase the surface area. But then if you compare the copper adsorption of those versus the ones from the broiler manure that had no um, acid ox or oxidation uh, type of step, we got much better results on the copper adsorption right there and definitely much better results when comparing those with this F400, which is a Calgon product. It's a, men, it's a uh, commercial um, activator carbon and this iron exchange resin RO3515. So um, no matter what the fact that they had high porosity, that still was not enough to go ahead and, and make this um, commercial products um, good adsorbents for um, heavy metals. Next one, please. Finally, um, it was interesting to look into a soil application. So here, we spiked soil with biochar, with biochar first. We, we amended it with biochar at 10%, and then we spiked it with 300 micromoles of each of these metals. And then we looked at what happened before and after. So um, what we found out, um, here we have basically a series of cotton hull biochars. Cotton hull is a waste of the cotton um, industry. And we had them activated at different temperatures, 350, 500 um, Fahrenheit, 650, um, I'm sorry, Celsius, 650 and 800. Then we had a, a pecan shell carbon um, um, biochar. And then we had finally our broiler liter biochar produced at 700. And, and then we had soil only without biochar. Um, one thing stands out, soil itself already um, was able to absorb some of the heavy metals, but um, the biochars in general adsorb significant amounts of all these heavy metals where both the cotton hull uh, 350 and, and the broiler litter 700, almost all of them, the amounts of um, spiked metals went down to almost nothing. So that means that the heavy metals that were spiked onto the soil, they were all locked up and adsorbed by the um, amending of biochar into the soil. Um, if you look at the total amount, uh, broiler liter at 700 degrees Celsius um, was a very good candidate for after the, uh, the cotton hull uh, produced at 350. I dare say that if we have used them um, Broiler litter at 350, we probably would even see better results in this um, test here. Next one, please. So um, we wanted to look a few years ago at about how much does it cost to produce um, biochars from animal manure. So we did a, a very, very um, um, complete study and we looked at different size manufacturing facilities. We've used almost all um, information we could, obtaining the litter from a farm, uh, transporting the litter up to 10 miles to the processing facility, using state-of-the-art equipment, everything you need um, from your pyrolysis furnace, your furnace um, to do steam activation if you need to. And um, the facility would convert culture litter into biochar continuously for 24 hours a day, 330 days a year. So um, we used um, all kinds of um, information. Production costs includes utilities, operating and maintenance. We used labor and supply costs, uh, facility overhead charges, etc. And we came up with these costs. So finally, we found out that we started with activator carbon um, acid wash to remove that um, additional mineral content. And we got a 65 cent per pound cost 
If you produce the biochar alone and you don't steam activate it, of course, the cost is lower, 38 cents if it's washed. And, and your cheapest cost would be producing just a biochar that is unwashed and that's um, at a cost of 32 cents per pound. This is on state-of-the-art facility. Um, I'm sure these prices would likely would go down if you use, if you retrofit your equipment. Um, and we didn't look at anything else. We looked straight forward at biochar manufacturing. Um, and then we looked at potential market size. Um, well, that depends on the availability of manure, which we all know there's plenty to go around. A small manufacturing facility would um, need probably 11 daily tons of manure. And you would need about 20 broiler houses for that. If you go all the way to a medium to large facility, you would need about 100 broiler houses. That's not hard to come by. And there's plenty of amount. Um, if we use 0.3 to 7 million tons a year of, of, of manure per year, we are already reaching 25 to half the um, activator carbon ma market. So there's plenty of manure to go around. Uh, it's, it's huge. Just in the south, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi produce one third of the broilers that produce the uh, manure. Um, and the Delmarva Peninsula is, they produce 1.2 million tons per year of manure. So they're very concentrated um, location of manure production and they have their own issues. Um, handling manure and disposing of it. Next one, please. So why use biochar again? When you use it as soil amendment, it has beneficial and tunable remedial properties. It can reduce exposure by limiting uh, the pathways and immobilizing contaminants. And that's um, the only way to go in certain ways. It can help to restore soil quality and health. And health. It can enable in situ remediation. So when you have a contaminated soil, you can transport that contaminated soil. So you have to do it in situ. You add by bio, a in situ and you lock up the pollutants and they do not um, leach out once you do that. Uh, revegetation, revitalization, and reuse. Um, it's a carbon negative material. It removes carbon um, dioxide from the atmosphere. That's major. Um, when used to remediate contaminated sites, contaminated soil and sediments, they need remediation. And a lot of times, like I said, we can't transport them out. You have to bring the biochar in and lock in those pollutants right then and there. Um, there's tons of abandoned mines across the U.S. and they pose a considerable and pervasive risk to human health. So um, that's just mines. Then we have thousands of acres of degraded soils and our agriculture in of itself uh, produces degraded soils because a lot of times just we over agriculture our fields and what we need to do is add back carbon into the soil and what better way to do so than to add biochar again. Next one. So, um, so biochar is beneficial for soil health, improves the infiltration and water holding properties, it rejuvenates the soil, it adds carbon that is much needed in specially weathered soils. Hey, uh, Isabel, this is Dibs. Like, uh, we have yeah, we're, we're, I'll, I'll pass it on to um, Dominic so she can wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is just summarizing what we've heard, and I just wanted to add a, a couple additional points to um, Isabel's uh, discussion on improving soil health for, in, for infiltration. Um, I've had uh, a special interest in um, enhancement, improving the performance of green infrastructure. Uh, for those of us working in New Jersey, uh, DEP on March 2nd put out uh, the green infrastructure rulemaking um, as part our enhancement to stormwater uh, requirements, which will uh, require first a demonstration of green infrastructure. Think of all of these um, um, historic uh, fill uh, throughout the state and these post-industrial corridors as well throughout the country that have high uh, concentrations of, of um, heavy metals. Um, as well as what runs off of highways. I mean, lead um, near some highways has been found to be in the, you know, 11,000 parts per million range. 
So I was particularly intrigued by both the fact that this is a soil amendment that improves porosity um, and the ability to um, hold and treat water and also its additional benefits, uh, for example, for bioretention, which historically has really not been um, focused as much on its ability to remove concentrations of heavy metals, uh, but being able to improve that performance. And that's just a graphic that shows why uh, these are many of the properties that Isabel has, uh, has reviewed. And, and just one more note, and this is um, Isabel's quote, uh, as we've been working on uh, what we call a living lab um, in and around our sites and with uh, others and um, looking at the, uh, the efficacy and uh, performance of biochar to actual uh, um, data from the field and finding incredible uh, results. I do want to mention that as Isabel talked, uh, Dr. Lima talked about um, poultry, biochar, and phosphate. Uh, for those of you wondering about water quality, speaking of, of, uh, of uh, runoff, um, it is bioavailable phosphate. It is not in a form that would run off. And in fact, is why make, this is what makes uh, the manure-based char in this case, uh, other chars as well, um, a great natural fertilizer because of what its ability to um, support a healthy microbial environment and support the rhizomes. Uh, so it is also think about the fact that we're running out of phos phosphate, phosphorus, phosphate supplies around the world that produces our food. food. This is also a way to harvest um, phosphorus. So final thoughts. Um, Biochar has been used for many years as a soil amendment. Uh, we can go back to the Amazonian example. Uh, but what we wanted to really deliver to you today is the value proposition that it is much more than that. Um, the integration of carbon production with waste management uh, pro promises a new carbon era. So I call it um, sort of the new carbon economy, the new carbon era is carbon negative um, and it's circular. And that's what's exciting about this in terms of where we are um, in, in a, as a sustainable society in a, in a sustainable, resilient planet. Biomass waste streams are abundant. Um, you just heard Dr. Lima talk about uh, waste streams related to um, agricultural um, manure uh, stock supplies, if you will. Um, current disposal practices um, are greenhouse gas heavy, incineration being uh, the, the, the biggie here, um, and are pose adverse impacts to food, water, ecosystems, and public health. And I might mention that we also have seen recent data um, in the um, bioremediation world as we have been successful with what we call vegetated caps that many of these vegetated caps are eroding and in a number of urbanized areas where they are located, um, creating exposures to lead. Here's an, is a more sustainable solution um, where the amendment with a manure-based char such as what we just heard could bind uh, and immobilize, bind, and eliminate that exposure. It acts like a magnet. It's not just um, the capping. When a, a strong storm comes through, you've got the exposure. Um, this is an opportunity to better protect human health and the environment and also grow an economy. Um, it's more profitable and resilient approach. Um, we can also talk about renewable fuels and eco-friendly biochars. I think what we try to give you a sense of is that there is so much more um, to explore and to understand and to apply as it relates to uh, the value of biochars. And I will stop there. All right. Thank you so much, Isabel. Thank you so much.